H2O, your guide to boats and boating. This week we're here in Annapolis, Maryland, and I am with Squire Fred Taylor, the official town crier of Annapolis. Ah, welcome to the first peacetime capital of the United States of America and the sailing capital of the United States. Give me a history, a brief history of the area here in Annapolis, and we're, we're in the downtown area, is that correct? Ah, uh, yes we are, we're in the historic district. It was, uh, say, the charter was given in 1632 to the Calvert family from North Yorkshire, England. The town itself, uh, it, it was in 1708 that Queen Anne uh, gave the charter for the city itself. It is the first peacetime capital of the United States of America. It is where George Washington resigned his commission at the end of the revolution in the State House capital. It is also where the Treaty of Paris ended the revolution and also the same state house where Thomas Jefferson was made a minister to the country of France. This town looks like it is, has remained pretty much in a colonial state. Is there a purpose in that? Uh, historic preservation became very popular in the 1960s. There, you will find no place else in the United States of America that has more colonial homes of George Washington's time than this town itself. There are more than 50 homes here that go back to the day. H2O, your guide to boats and boating. This week we're here in Annapolis, Maryland, and I am with Squire Fred Taylor, the official town crier of Annapolis. Ah, welcome to the first peacetime capital of the United States of America and the sailing capital of the United States. Give me a history, a brief history of the area here in Annapolis, and we're, we're in the downtown area, is that correct? Ah, uh, yes we are, we're in the historic district. It was, uh, say, the charter was given in 1632 to the Calvert family from North Yorkshire, England. The town itself, uh, it, it was in 1708 that Queen Anne uh, gave the charter for the city itself. It is the first peacetime capital of the United States of America. It is where George Washington resigned his commission at the end of the revolution in the State House capital. It is also where the Treaty of Paris ended the revolution and also the same state house where Thomas Jefferson was made a minister to the country of France. This town looks like it is, has remained pretty much in a colonial state. Is there a purpose in that? Uh, historic preservation became very popular in the 1960s. There, you will find no place else in the United States of America that has more colonial homes of George Washington's time than this town itself. There are more than 50 homes here that go back to the days of George Washington. When was this town established? Well, this town itself, uh, 1708 is when they received their charter. 1649 is when some <coughs> from the Puritan colony of Virginia, I uh, say, came over here and established the first little town. Fred, I understand there's a very famous person buried here at the Naval Academy. Do you know of that person? Ah, yes, sailed the seas, 1779. Uh, encountered the British off of the northeast coast of England and told them, I say, during the battle, I have not yet begun to fight. Yes, the man that gave the Navy its first true traditions, John Paul Jones, in the crypt over, I say, what I call the Cathedral of the Navy, underneath the chapel at the United States Naval Academy. Now, my, my friends have told me I may not be the brightest bulb in the pack, but I understand that Annapolis was at one point in time the capital of the United States? Annapolis is the only city in the United States of America that has served as both the capital of its state, or colony, as well as the capital of the United States of America. For nine months, while the Continental Congress was sitting up there in the State House, this was the capital of the United States of America. Very good. Let's go take a tour. Well, shall we? Well, I'm uh, Jock Williams, and I, uh, I'm the president of the John Williams Boat Building Company, and we uh, have a facility up on Mount Desert Island, Maine, 
where we build a line of power boats called the Stanleys. We have a 26, 28, 36, 39, and 44 footers, which were derived originally from workboat hulls. They're, they were designed and built to be workboats, but in the early 80s we shifted to pleasure boats and we started building um, nicely finished pleasure boats on workboat I think that the design, you know, affords a very sea kindly hull. It, it will perform in most most conditions that uh, you will take her out in, 15, 18 knots of wind and a good sea. Uh, she'll handle that very nicely. Uh, because it is a workboat, it is designed to provide a ride that doesn't wear a person out. Uh, if a person is lobstering, a fisherman is lobstering all day, he's usually out for around 12 hours. And, you know, he gets extremely tired if it's a, if it's a, a boat that reacts more or less like a hard chine boat, so too quick. This is a soft chine boat. It's got a dead rise and rocker. It, it rides in and out of the seas very nicely. It also maneuvers very well, so it has nice characteristics. It's not particularly fast. It'll cruise at 17 or 18 knots, and it'll top out at around 21. That's pretty much average for all of the boats that we build. Um, we power them with diesel engines, and but I think the the way the boat handles is probably is one of the most important features. There are two after lockers at the at the end of the pilot house. One is a for an ice machine, and the other is a chest of drawers. It sleeps two people. Uh, it has. Uh, propane stove and it has air conditioning, it has a microwave oven. Um, those are some of the, the features. This boat has uh, these seats here that you'll see. These are seats that we designed. These are the helm seats and they're, they're, they're a nice traditional looking seat. And the settee that's on the port side is one that we built specifically. The gentleman likes to have his wife and his, his daughter come along, uh, often when he's going fishing or out for a trip. And the seat is built so that it's elevated, uh, so that the height of eye is such that you can see out nicely. Also, I think that our woodwork is unique. We, we don't, we don't uh, try to avoid wood. We put a fair amount of wood in our boats, and we use the wood, all of it's structural, so that uh, we're building in a very traditional manner. So that what you see in a boat such as this is a lot of teak in this one because the gentleman who had it built wanted the interior to all be teak and the exterior to, to, as well. And it's all varnished teak. Where are we now? Uh, we're on the uh, front lawn of St. John's College, a uh, college which they trace back to King William School in 1696, and they claim they're the third oldest college in the United States of America, that only Harvard and William and Mary are any older than St. John's College. If one comes to school here, you would never have to uh, take an examination because they do not give them. Uh, you never have to worry about a grade because they do not publish them. And you never have to worry about a wrong answer because everything you tell them is the right answer. There are no departments. They uh, all study the same great books. And there's a little more than 100 great books. And some of them they'll read right from, you know, the original texts of the Greek. Uh, others they read uh, in their entirety. And at the end of four years, everyone receives a Bachelor of Arts degree in liberal arts. And then there was a young man. He started here at the age of 10 in 1789 and finished at the age of 17. Uh, went on to become a very, very good lawyer in the United States of America, the United States District Attorney over in Washington, D.C., what I call the Swampland. Uh, argued cases before the Supreme Court. Uh, also dabbled in some poetry. And his poem, you hear it almost every day. Oh, thus be it ever when freemen shall stand between the love homes and war's desolation. Blessed with victory and peace, may the heaven rescue land. Praise the power that made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause is just. And this be our motto, in God is our trust. And the star-spangled banner, oh long may it wave, o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. And I feel certain you could sing the first verse, could you not? 
Oh, say can you see by the... Oh, I'm not going any further. That's it. I'm done. Francis Scott <laughs> Key, he graduated number one in his class, gave the valedictorian speech. I think there were seven in the class. Uh, went on to become a very good lawyer and the founder of the Alumni Association, where we see the monument. So you're thinking about buying a boat, but don't know if you want to own the whole boat and all of the problems that may go with it. In this week's news ticker, we're going to talk about fractional ownership. Uh, well, fractional ownership is essentially, we take a brand new boat, a Catalina yacht, we divide up its time between eight individuals. Um, the management company takes care of all the responsibilities, fuel, water, pump out, insurance, maintenance, haul out, the whole deal. And then the members pay a low monthly fee and get to go sailing. We take care of all the headaches. Well, the benefits are really the, the ability to get to go out on the water and enjoy a sailboat like you own it without actually owning the boat. Um, you don't have any of the, the worries of depreciation, resale, insurance claims, slip fees, all that stuff. Uh, you know, again, we take care of all the headaches and you just get to go out sailing and, and enjoy your new boat. Uh, average cost for a Catalina 350, which is a 35 foot boat, uh, is between five and 600 a month, depending on the location, and uh, slip fees and insurance really dictate the monthly fees. Uh, every member is guaranteed seven uses per month. Um, all the scheduling is done online in real time via a proprietary application we developed uh, called Sailsoft. And so as a member, you just log in and you, you book the time you like to use and then you uh, go out and sail during it. Take it anywhere from a single day up to a full seven days. When you compare it to sole ownership or to single-use charter, which are really the two you know, major options out there for most people today, uh, you either buy a boat or you charter one, there's a huge gap in between um, for people who want to go sailing in their local waters and don't have the time or don't have the money to make it happen. So we fill that gap, um, which we believe is a, a major percentage of the boating market, and, and we help those people get out on the water. Uh, since 1985, we've taught over 60,000 primarily women. It's a sailing school for women simply because I'm a woman and I wanted other women to find out how great sailing really is. It adds a dimension to your life that most of us don't have. I mean, women do participate in teams and physical sports a lot more than they used to. But the idea of working with a crew, taking turns, doing everything on a boat and making it go, has really made a difference uh, in a lot of women's lives. Current Annapolis is our home port, and uh, we're here from April through October, but we teach in 16 locations around the world, including Greece and Turkey and New Zealand and Ireland. So we take students from all over the world, 18 to 84 are the ages so far, and uh, they learn how to become sailors in their own right, either on their own boats, uh, with their husbands, with their children. Um, so it's, it's just been a way of bringing women along in sailing. Before us, there were very few women who really felt comfortable sailing. I think womanship has actually taught or helped along most of the female skippers who, who uh, teach or work on boats today. Surveyors, boat captains, uh, they all came through the womanship program. So in a little way, we've made a considerable difference. We're here at what we call Lawyer's Mall, here in front of the uh, capital of Annapolis. Uh, Lawyer's Mall has one of the most distinguished lawyers that uh, anyone could find, uh, Thurgood Marshall, uh, best known for one of his landmark decisions that he was part of, Brown versus the Board of Education, which desegregated schools in the United States of America in 1954. And just beyond Lawyer's Mall, behind the, the gates, uh, that's the Governor's Mansion. And right here before us is the State House. Um, the original State House underneath the White Dome, built in 1772 and finished in 1779. And it's been used ever since then uh, for legislative purposes. I don't think you'll find any place else in the United States of America where you'll find an older state house than this one. And that dome that you look at from the outside has not one piece of lead or metal in it at all. It is all fashioned together with cypress trees and wooden pegs, fashioned with what you call mortise and tenon. In the 1780s is when it was finished, 
and uh, still standing to this day. And when we go inside, you're going to find there's another dome. That's truly a double dome. Uh, plaster dome sits underneath that one, also finished in the late 1780s. My name is Olaf Krog. I'm with the Nordic Star brand. We uh, have just launched this Norwegian brand here in the United States. This is a 33-foot day uh, runabout. Uh, it's been very well rece received because she's she's a very pretty boat. We um, uh, we've built a boat that should appeal to the absolutely most discerning buyer. Uh, she has beautiful teak all around. She has very elegant lines that everybody seems to like. And um, we have a small V berth down below, which, which will accommodate an overnight for, for a couple. And of course, it has a head. It has a 315 Yan Mar diesel, which gives her plenty of speed. She, she uh, does about 30 knots, cruises very comfortably about 24. And uh, with our Viking heritage, of course, she handles well in the water. And, uh, and, and here we have a nice place where we can enjoy our pickled herring and other things that we eat in Norway, um, with other things as well, of course. Um, and, and overall, she's a, she's a well-built, very well-designed boat. This boat is a real head-turner. Her lines are absolutely a blend of some very beautiful traditional uh, traditional lines that go back to some of the 1920s, early 30s designs here in the U.S. with some very, very pretty new, um, new sort of contemporary European things like this windshield, which is this one-piece windshield, which we're having made by somebody who makes windshields for Mercedes-Benz. Um, but she also has this kind of crisp Nordic look to her. So in addition to being a good boat in the water, her looks are absolutely stunning. And, and I bet anyone looking at her would agree with that. This boat has phenomenal looks, yet it's priced very reasonably. And that combination is a winning combination. I'm here with Ken Kay of Schooner Woodwind. It's a company that takes charters out. Ken, tell us about your charters and what do we do here? Well, we do all kinds of charters. Uh, this is one of the uh, few places here we are in Annapolis, the sailing capital. And uh, the only way to go sailing is on one of our boats. You can just buy a ticket and come down to the Marriott dock and you're all set. Uh, if you want to do a corporate event um, or a, um, a, a birthday or a uh, uh, you know, whatever you want to do, you can also privately charter the boats. In fact, we have the only two identical schooners owned by the same company in the world, and we match race them. So if you're looking for a, a superb corporate team building event, we, uh, we can do that. And that is a lot of fun. I understand one of your boats is a little notorious. Well, this boat has been in the uh, movie Wedding Crashers. And I don't know how many people uh, saw the Wedding Crashers, but uh, uh, I guess it's in the millions, which is kind of <laughs> mind-boggling. Uh, Christopher Walken was standing right here. We had uh, Owen Wilson um, and Vince Vaughn on board. Um, when Owen Wilson, I said, no, when um, Christopher Walken takes to the helm and he says, John, me boy, come back here and steer the woodwind. He wasn't actually steering. He was actually loosely holding the wheel. And my daughter, Jen, was lying down here. And she had a compass on her chest Make, uh, to, so she knew which way the boat was going and she was steering it. When she asked Mr. Walken to take the helm, his response was, I act, I don't steer. <laughs>
My name is Mark Bruckman and I'm uh, with Bruckman Yachts, a custom builder situated in just outside of Toronto in Canada. And we're sitting on a Bruckman 50 motor sailor uh, built on a semi-custom basis for discerning clients. In this particular model, um, the quality of build and the ability to customize each vessel to each person's requirements and the performance and comfort of this particular design are pretty well unique in this size of vessel, which is around 50 foot sailing vessel size. Put on a boat. I guess the, the, the most uh, striking difference from most of the competition is the quality of the build and the finish of, of the work. Um, there aren't that many series built boats that are finished to this quality level at a reasonable price uh, anymore. So that's probably the, the most discerning uh, characteristic of these boats. And all, and all of the designs are essentially purpose, they're purpose built and purpose designed. They're not, uh, so, so that each individual boat has a, a certain function. Uh, right from, from, from the design stage. This boat is a Bruckman 50 motor sailor. It's a 50 foot motor sailor and, and its prime target is to satisfy sailors that are considering the move to power because sail is too much work for them. And they want more comfort in the boat than a, than a conventional sailboat. So this boat gives them the comfort of a power boat but still allows them to sail and properly sail. This, this boat sails properly like a, like a proper sailboat. Uh, this boat under power can power nine to 10 knots just under power, which is you know, you know, three knots faster than most sailboats of the same size. But it also still sails as well as most 50 foot sailboats speeds of, uh, depending on the wind conditions, you know, 10, 11 knots. Uh, so it does both very well. I'm with Bruce Whalen. Bruce, this is Jimmy Cantler's Riverside Inn. First question I 